lots and lots of world building in this week's episode of Dragon Ball Super. So, we apparently found out how the time rings work. Not completely, but we kind of get a brief insight to how they come about or how they're created. So, from what we can gather from this episode is that the original time ring, which is the silver ring, is the original one. And the green rings are the ones to when time has been altered in some way, like when a new timeline has reappeared. And this episode brings up many questions about the world of Dragon Ball Super, but also you have to wonder exactly what does this mean overall. So one thing I want to completely dive into, which fascinated me about this episode, is that we do know, which was told to us in this episode, that apparently many years ago there was a new time ring created. A new one was made thanks to some idiot that made, you know, a different like alternate timeline, which if we think back to the events of Dragon Ball Z, we know of that certain idiot that probably did that, which is Trunks. Trunks going to our timeline to where he saved Goku and then they took down the androids. But that doesn't really make sense if you really think about everything, because as we know, which many might have forgotten, but I'm willing to bet that the writers of Dragon Ball Super might not have forgotten because they were willing to actually mention it already somewhat in the series of Dragon Ball Super, as we know. Cell came from another time machine. There's two time machines that were brought to our present time in Dragon Ball Super. Two time machines were brought. One was from Cell, one was from Future Trunks. And as we remember, if you think back to when Cell was talking to Future Trunks when they had their brief fight, he was like, I am the one that killed you. I killed you, stole your time machine, and I came back to the past. And you already deactivated the android, so there was no point in me staying in this timeline. Everything I wanted to achieve was lost. I couldn't, you know, accomplish my goal I was set out to do to become perfect. So Cell was forced to take the time machine to go back in the past. Now, here is the thing. Before that, too, as we know, once that was done, Trunks also came to the past to warn Goku of the androids, and he was also the person that killed Frieza when he was coming to hurt the Earth. And then after that, Trunks came around and then helped Goku and then fight the androids and then take down Cell. And if you think about all of these events, if anything, there should be at the very least two new time rings made, not one that was made. Which is very strange because we do know that there's two different timelines when it comes to the future. Because look, in one future, Trunks managed to deactivate the androids and then he was going back to tell the good news to everyone and then he died thanks to Cell. And then Cell came to the past in our present as a timeline and then you know trunks in his future everybody was dead everybody died he just obtained super saiyan and he also could not deactivate the android so he had to come back to the other timeline to be able to warn goku and maybe change something so we have in total right now three timelines we have our present timeline we're normally seeing we have the one to where trunks died and he deactivated the androids and cell left and then you have the other timeline to where the androids have been defeated uh trunks is still alive trunks is like the only survivor and then black is taken Taken over like that in kind of universe. So the main question here is, is what is going on? Why was it said only one ring was made when there has to be at the very least two rings that were made? And this, this can go even further than that to even dive in more into this timeline, which this is one of the things when it comes to anime manga or any form of literature, when it comes to manipulating time or time travel going into the past or the future, it can get rather complicated, complex, and you're like, okay, so this doesn't make any sense. And it could really t wear down the plot and make it kind of trash. I'm, I'm just going to be straight up honest with you. When it comes to, you know, time travel and stuff, a lot of series can be just dragged down and become something that is like, ugh, this, this is just, you know, awful. It, it just doesn't make any sense. And that's one of the biggest things when it comes to writing. you got to sometimes know how to write time travel or got to do it in a way that makes sense. And that's why I actually really love Steins Gate because it was time travel done right. But getting off of Steins Gate, that has no relevance into, you know, this episode. One thing that we know is, is that Trunks, he appeared in the past, in our timeline, to warn Goku about Frieza. Like, he, he came to defeat Frieza, not warn him. Defeat Frieza, warn about the androids, give Goku the antidote to the heart disease he was going to get to where he was going to die, and then Trunks went back to his future. Now, as we know, if, you know, there is multiple different timelines alternating or, you know, changing the future in any way, Trunks coming back at that moment automatically changed the timeline, made an alternate timeline. That, 
that was instantly a big change right there when Trunks came back and saved Goku. Now, the next thing after that we have to think is Cell came back. And thanks to Cell being in the universe, it caused it to where Perfect Cell was born. Gohan ascended to Super Saiyan 2. They had to stop him and all that. So, if we think about it like that, there's two timelines right there. But then when Trunks comes back to fight the androids with Goku in them, that automatically most likely could have made another timeline too. So, that's a possibility of three different timelines right there. And then, going even further than that... As we know, Trunks coming to our timeline now in Dragon Ball Super, it changes events entirely about, you know, Black and where Black came from and all that. And if it wasn't for Trunks coming to this timeline, it wouldn't have caused it where Zamasu could have possibly have turned evil. Zamasu might still be a good guy. I mean, he would be borderlining that purity and evil, but he wouldn't have been tipped over the edge to where he starts becoming a villain. And you could see these clear signs throughout this entire episode that he is definitely becoming eviler as, you know, time goes on in the episode. So, Trunks, like, changed the future and altered the future, at the very least, two or maybe three times already in Dragon Ball Z and Super, and then sell on top of that, which would make four. We're unaware if there's different alternate futures for individual universes. For instance, we don't know if, let's say, Universe 7 and Universe 6 has different timelines. For instance, let's say Trunks comes to Universe 6 or whatever, he changes the timeline up. Does that mean, necessarily, it could change, you know, Universe 7? I mean, if we think about all the different type of details here. I mean, we do know it was thanks to Trunks, like, you know, saving Goku and the why Trunks or Goku can meet Beerus and the why, you know, Goku is able to meet Champa as well from another universe, another god of destruction. So if you think about it like that, the interactions that Trunks caused with the timeline caused it to where Goku came in contact with other universes. So if this universe, let's say Universe 6, has been altered, does that also alter another universe? Is their timelines connected in any way? Or are they running off their own time rings? I'm just very curious about that. That wasn't necessarily clarified when it came to this episode of Dragon Ball Super. So yeah, now one thing I do want to say before I drop the timeline discussion, I truly believe that Zamasu, he was created thanks to Goku. I, I think that's what's going on here. I truly believe that is what's going on because Goku fighting him caused it to where he started turning into that level of evil and then now he's trying to do some corrupt shit and we already see it going on throughout this episode. So I think it's thanks to Goku visiting him is what actually caused this to begin with at all and what caused it to where Goku Black was made in the future and as we know now since we have to where Zamasu has access to the time rings he kind of knows how they work and he's like a, a, a Kai he's like a real Kai right now he's not an apprentice because he has the earring which oh by the way, the earrings. I am a big fan of what the writers... I don't know who wrote this episode. I don't know if Akira Toriyama is actually really writing the entirety of Dragon Ball Super. I'm kind of unaware. I've kind of stayed out of the loop of that. But whoever wrote this episode, I am a big fan of the way the earrings were brought back into the actual plot of Dragon Ball. Because one of the things I really loved about Dragon Ball Z was how they were very important. How, you know, you two people could fuse. How Kai's could fuse as well. And then, you know, how Goku and Vegeta fused in, you know, the end of Dragon Ball Z. I'm glad they're brought back in this episode and how they're actually important. They kind of show who's a real Kai, and it explains how Goku Black is able to use the time ring to be able to go through the different timelines is because he has that earring, which is from a Kai. Now, that raises many, many questions right there because that would mean that Goku Black either had to come in contact with a Kai and the Kai gave it to him, which is Amasu maybe, or some form of Kai may, may have fused with Goku Black, or two, Goku Black stole a ring and killed a Kai. One or the other had to have happened, but whatever the case may be, I do like how we found out more about the earrings and what they actually can do besides just fusion. And I really, really love that. Now, one last thing to get into is definitely the other segments of this episode, which you had it to where Vegeta was training Trunks, and I was a big fan of that. I love seeing how much Vegeta has progressed as a father and as a person throughout Dragon Ball Z and Super. It's a great showcase to just see how much his personality is kind of toned down compared to what it was in the past. I mean, if we compare the Cell Saga Vegeta to this Vegeta in Dragon Ball Super, there is a complete difference in their attitude. Vegeta has definitely calmed down and became more of a family man. I mean, the way he actually willingly came to Trunks and was like, hey, let's have some training, let's have a sparring match, that was something that Vegeta normally would never have done with Trunks in the Cell Saga, and Trunks de definitely saw it. He kind of was shocked throughout this episode when Vegeta offered to train him, because as we remember in the Hyperbolic Time Chamber, Vegeta didn't really want to fight with his son. He didn't really even give a shit at all. He didn't want to even 
fighting him. He was too proud and all that. He didn't want to go up against him or anything. And so just to see how much Vegeta has changed and mellowed out and how he's willing to help Trunks out his son and give him like to, you know, a future to where he wants to be stronger. I really respect that and I like the way Vegeta was actually being a very good father figure throughout this episode. And the way Goku, oh my god, Goku was a very mature person in this episode, which I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. is this the same character? Goku brought Bulma to the fighting area to where Trunks and Vegeta were fighting and allowed Bulma to see it, and I like that. I like how Goku was allowing Bulma to see this father and son bonding moment. It just... It felt so unlike Goku. I mean, Goku has these rare moments of being very smart and intelligent and doing these good things. But, oh my god, just seeing this man bringing Bulma to look at Trunks and Vegeta fighting, that was a very good move by Goku. Regardless of how Bulma reacted, just seeing how Goku brought her to watch these two actually spending time together, that's 10 out of 10 right there. That's a really good moment of this episode of Dragon Ball Super. I don't know how many people probably might not care about that scene, but that was a really well-executed scene that really blew me away with how Goku reacted and how he brought Bulma there. And oh yes, I do love how Vegeta was trash talking Trunks' form when Trunks turned into like Super Saiyan like 1.5. I forget the exact name. I think it was like Ultimate Super Saiyan or something like that. I forget the exact title of what people have dubbed it in the past, but I'm just going to call it Super Saiyan 1.5 or you know, kind of like bulky beefcake Super Saiyan. Whatever the case may be, just seeing that form once again, Trunks transforming into it and Vegeta trashes him like, oh why would you use that form? You haven't learned at all because one of the main reasons why Trunks got defeated by Cell in the first place in you know earlier on Dragon Ball Z was thanks to using that Form. He was too bulky, too slow, couldn't have a lot of speed, he had a lot of power, just didn't have the speed to match it, and that's what Gohan accomplished to be able to go into Super Saiyan 2 in Defeat Cell. And when Trunks actually used that against Vegeta to kind of lower his guard, I respect that, and I do like how he used that tactic. That was something I truly was happy to see. And then on top of that, the way Trunks said, I'm going to be better than you, I want to get stronger, I want to beat Goku Black, and I'm going to outbeat you, my father. I'm going to get stronger than you. That was such a great moment moment seeing Trunks just declare that in front of Vegeta. You know Vegeta, when he was walking off and he got headbutted and shit, like when he was just, you know, kind of got hit and he was like shocked, I really like how his face wasn't shown at all. Because we know one thing when it comes to Vegeta, he still has that pride. He's still a very proud person. He may have mellowed out, he may be a lot calmer than he was in the past, but he still has that pride he had in the past. And just seeing how he walked off, we didn't really get to see his face at all. I'm actually glad that was done. I'm glad we didn't get to see what face Vegeta was making. We don't know if he had a frown on his face. We don't know if he had a smile on his face. It's left up to speculation of what you think was really going on in Vegeta's mind. And if I had to guess what Vegeta was thinking at the time, judging by his personality and how he reacted in this episode, I'm willing to bet the man probably was smiling and had this like big fucking smile up to his damn eyeballs because of his son and how he said, I want to surpass you. You know Vegeta had to be just so proud of his son at that moment when he was walking off and we didn't get to see his face. Now, getting off of that, let's talk about one scene which I don't think many are going to care about. Actually, there's two scenes, and one of the scenes is Emperor Pilaf and Bulma's scene. And at first glance, it looks like the scene is kind of like meh. It's a, like a filler scene, and at the end of the day, I guess you can kind of consider that. But it was a nod to Dragon Ball, which I was surprised to see because if there's one things that one of the things that Dragon Ball Super hasn't been doing, it hasn't been showing the intellect of Emperor Pilaf and how smart he was in the original Dragon Ball. See, Emperor Pilaf may be some form of a comedy-ish type character. He is a villain and all that. But just seeing how many of moments of Dragon Ball Super, it seems like they forgot how smart he was, I'm glad to see this nod to him of how he is intelligent, how he can make stuff, and how he actually made the program to the time machine a whole lot better than it was, and Bulma was actually proud and happy. I like seeing that nod to Emperor Pilaf's intelligence and how he's not just a stupid kid the way they're trying to make him look throughout the entirety of Dragon Ball Super. So I do like that move by Toei Animation and the writer of this episode. And another thing too I need to get into is the image training at the beginning of the episode. Now, as I said already, I'm not the biggest fan of the mind trunk scene I'm not because I get it. I understand what they're trying to do. I don't need it shoved in my face every single episode. I mean, I like my romance. Don't get me wrong. It's just I understand what they're trying to do. You don't have to shove it in my face. It's the same thing I see every episode. I just don't give a shit. I, I really don't. I'm just going to be honest with all of you. I don't give a shit. I mean, if they get together, that's good. I'm glad to see Trunks get someone. But at this time, I'm like, okay, it just it's 
there to draw out the episode just for filler. But when it came to the image training, though, that is the scene I liked. And it was kind of, once again, another callback to Dragon Ball Z. And I feel like many might kind of misinterpret this scene or be upset with this scene, think it was kind of stupid or something. But there was many cases in Dragon Ball Z where there was image training used. Yes, there was many cases in Dragon Ball Z and Dragon Ball where image training actually was used in the series. And I do like seeing these little elements that were from the original series being used in this episode. It's just... It makes the episode so much better. It really does. It brings back nostalgia and allows us to run see exactly that these writers remember the greatness of the original two series of Dragon Ball and Dragon Ball Z. So yeah, episode overall, I loved it. Cannot wait to see what happens next. I mean, seeing the King of All contacting Beerus and Beerus headbutting the fucking table, I laughed my ass off. And seeing how he's calling for Goku to meet him, can't wait to see what happens next. You all have a wonderful day or nights wherever you live. Please be safe. Chibi out.